The scary stories will start in 40 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. I am truly committed to making your experience with my channel the best it can be, which is why there are only two mid-roll ads in this video. There's one after the first story, and one after the second. That's it. I want you to enjoy the rest of the video with no interruptions. So again, if you enjoy my videos and want to show your support to this channel, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me so much. Now, let's begin. I work summers as a camp counselor in the northern parts of Ontario, Canada. On the date this particular incident occurred, I was camping with a group of 10-year-old boys on the same lake the summer camp was based on. So like a routine camping trip, we canoed out to the site and set up our tents. Me and my co-counselor Mike take turns supervising the kids while they swim, build forts and play games, etc. We cook some food over the fire, sit around and tell stories, cook s'mores, the typical Canadian camping experience. Around 9.30ish, I tell the kids it's time for bed, and they head into their tents, which were positioned a small walk away from the shoreline, but still in line of sight from where we had the fire pit. So the kids have gone to bed, and me and Mike are talking by the water smoking a cigarette, just basically hanging out, before we decide to head into our tent and call it a night. What happened next still troubles me to this day and remains my go-to scary campfire story. We were both gazing into the pitch black night water when we saw a small light approaching us slowly and slightly above water level. We speculated what it could possibly be for a few minutes before it came close enough for us to see that it was mounted on the front of a kayak and that someone was approaching our campsite. Now, it is important to note that as a camp counselor, part of our training goes over how to deal with stranger encounters in an environment where we are responsible for a group of children on public property. I was prepared to give the mystery paddler the typical speech about how we are camping with a group from a recognized organization and we would respectfully ask that they find another campsite. However, this person's appearance shook me to the bone as the light drew nearer. Paddling this kayak was a woman who looked to be in her 60s. She had incredibly long wisps of gray hair that was trailing in the water. Her skin looked like old leather, and her dead-looking eyes were tough to spot under all her wrinkles. She looked directly at me, and when she spoke, I realized she was missing most of her teeth. Are all your children safe in bed? She asked me, pointing in the direction of the tents. Not really knowing how to respond, and quite frankly, terrified, I responded by telling her that they were fine and that she had to leave. That's good. Just as expected for this time, she said with a smile then turned her kayak and paddled off into the night. At this point in time, myself and Mike were legitimately very creeped out, not only by the appearance of this mystery woman who resembled a corpse, but also her inquiry on the whereabouts and safety of the kids that we had brought on this trip. Not knowing what else to do, we grabbed our hunting knives and sat by the fire after checking on the kids. Half an hour later, across the lake, a female counselor was leading another trip for kids the same age group. She sent me a text, which read something along the lines of, Hey Sean, stop messing with us. This isn't funny. My kids are really creeped out. I instantly called her and let her know that I had just seen someone near my campsite that seemed eerie 
and that I was not trying to play a joke on her. Apparently, one of her kids had opened their tent door to go to the bathroom and saw a woman with long gray hair standing a few feet away with her arms outstretched towards them. This happened on a Sunday night when I was about 10 years old in the mid-90s. My family house was on a short street, a dead end created by a railroad track. We had a two-story house with a basement, which was the farthest from the tracks, with windows on each floor and two in the basement. The stairs from our bedrooms upstairs led directly to the front door, which connected to a closed-in mud room, which also had a screen door and a glass door that only locked from the inside. Even friends and extended family would wait outside to be let into the porch, as that's where the doorbell was. From inside the porch, you could see right up the stairs through the window and the door. Across the house, parallel to the front door, was the back door. Both had a large window in them. It must have been June, because my older brother had a soccer game and I only had a week of school left. I personally found watching him struggle on the field and being forced to cheer while being eaten by bugs really boring and miserable, and I had just gotten a box set of Animorph books that I desperately wanted to be alone with. After about an hour of reasoning and pleading, I finally convinced my parents to let me stay at home alone for the first time while they went to the game. They were only going to be gone for a few hours, and although we didn't live in the best neighborhood, our neighbors were close family friends. I'd be fine. Mistake. Usually before a game, we would all go out and eat together, but since I was staying home, they ordered a pizza from down the street, my brother's favorite. I had already been face deep in the first book for half an hour when the doorbell rang. Pizza. I thought. I walked out from my bedroom and down the stairs to the living room. I got to the bottom of the stairs, and my father was at the door having a conversation with the delivery guy. They were talking about soccer, so I just decided to take the pizzas and keep on keeping on, which was when I noticed the delivery guy staring at me intently. He was a middle-aged man, and he was smiling at me in a way that I recognized. It was the same smile I had on my face when I told my parents I was old enough to spend the evening in the house, alone. It was a fake smile, but convincing. I walked past him through the living room to the kitchen and threw the pizzas on the counter and shoved my face into my book. My father talked to him for a few more minutes about sports and then closed the door. My family sat down to eat and chat while I forgot all about them, the food, and the delivery guy. Before they left, around 6.30 p.m., my parents wrote down all the emergency numbers, gave me instructions not to open the door, and headed out with my brother, and I waved them off, excited to finally have the house to myself, if only to read in silence. I locked the main door and headed up to my room to read. It was blissfully quiet, save for the sound of my dog's occasional barking in the backyard. I had just finished the first book and immediately started on the next, when the doorbell rang. The doorbell rang, and my dog lost his mind in the backyard. I was up in my bed immediately. I looked at my alarm clock for the first time since they left. It read 8 p.m. My whole family was at the game, and any extended family in the province was as well. No one would be coming over without calling, especially on a Sunday night. The doorbell rang again, and again, again. I remained frozen in place my book crumpling in my shaking hands. I, for the first time, was completely alone and terrified. My sly kid smile 
flashed in my mind, and I thought I was so clever convincing my parents that I wasn't scared to be alone. And then, another smile flashed in my memory. The pizza guy. And then the banging started. Loud, successive bangs that rattled me, if not the house. And now, from the backyard, my dog was livid. I could hear him barking and whining at the back door. I wanted to call someone, but the only phone was in the kitchen, which involved walking right past the front door. Trapped. Trapped like a rat. I panicked. I was scared to leave my room, as my feet would be visible to whomever it was once I entered the hallway. But what if it was just a neighbor, or an untimely Jehovah's Witness? I checked the alarm clock again, and was surprised that only minutes had gone by, and my parents wouldn't be back for an hour and a half minimum. I would have to wait it out. So I did. I got up as silently as possible and closed my bedroom door. Eventually, all the barking, ringing, and banging stopped. I waited for half an hour and then opened my door and crept out of my bedroom. Mistake. I crept down the hallway to the top of the stairs, trying to press myself into the far wall as out of sight as possible. But all the lights were on, and I realized that it was obvious that someone was home. I peered quickly down the stairs in the window, looking through it to the glass porch door, and saw no one. No one was there. I tore down the stairs and ran for the back door and checked outside. Nothing but my dog, who was all too happy to run inside. I let him in through a crack and slammed the door after him, locking it. And I realized it hadn't been locked before. Mistake. I turned to the phone, grabbing it, and about to dial my neighbor's number when my dog started acting like he was going to the vet. A low growl, accompanied by a crouch, backing away. I froze and looked in his direction, then followed his gaze to the window and the inner front door, where inside my porch, past the front screen and glass doors, stood a man I have never seen before, and he was staring at me, livid. I froze, paralyzed with fear, as I looked at him, and I could not look away. He was tall, slim, and had bags under his eyes. His hair was shoulder length and unkempt. He lifted his hand and placed it on the window, and then looked down as he tried to turn the knob, twice, but it was locked. I came out of my paralysis the second his eyes left mine, and I moved quickly to the side of the wall that led to the basement stairs. It blocked us from being able to see each other. Hiding. Hiding felt good. My dog, still in the corner, inched towards me, low to the ground and still growling. I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding. This couldn't get any worse. Wrong. I saw you, boy. I saw you. Open the door. My stomach nestled in my throat. I started crying. Trapped. Trapped like a rat. I have never really had a fight or flight moment, but there was nowhere to go. Back upstairs led right past him, and going down into the basement seemed even more terrifying as I would have to walk past the window in the middle of the staircase that looked out into the alley leading to my backyard. I saw you. You can't hide forever. You have to pay. You have to pay. He screamed through the door window, shaking the door as he pulled on it. I thought he would just break the window and unlock the door, so I descended slowly down the steps to the basement, going halfway just to put some distance between us. Mistake. I stood still, waiting and then silence, for a minute, nothing, 
and then the sound of the glass door and the screen door to the outside opening and slamming. More silence. My dog straightened out, walked over to the top of the stairs, and then looked right past me and started growling. I can still see you. I see you. I see you, boy, and you have to pay. I jumped and turned my head, and through the window to the alley, I saw his face. He was laying on the ground, staring at me. I see you. I know you're home. I see you. Nope. Bye. I bolted up the stairs to the inner front door, ripped it open, and then locked the glass door to the porch, and then backed up into the living room, closing the main door behind me, locking that too. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed the phone, unplugged it, and turned back around. He was at the door again, this time outside the porch. I steeled myself and ran up the stairs with the phone, dog in tow, to my parents' bedroom, which was the only room with a working phone jack and a lock on their door. And the doorbell started to ring. I closed and locked their door behind me left their light off, and plugged in the phone. I dialed my neighbors and got their answering machine. I dialed again. Machine. Every ring of the phone was matched by a ring of the doorbell. I called them over and over, finally whispering a message. Tom, it's Kevin. A man is trying to break into my house and I'm alone. I peered out of my parents' window and looked down into the front yard. He was still there, pacing, walking up and down the stairs, looking in the windows, walking out of sight as he entered the alleyway, and then back into the front. I noticed my neighbor's car wasn't there. They weren't even home, and it still hadn't occurred to me to call 911. So I hunkered down and waited with my dog, watching from the corner of the window. He walked back up to the porch, tried the door, and then the doorbell went off a few more times. And then he walked down the stairs and headed back out onto the street. He walked a bit down the sidewalk away from the dead end, towards the main road, and then stopped and turned around, walking back towards the house. He stopped again and looked up, directly at the window I was looking through, but the room was dark so he couldn't see me. Instead of turning back around, he continued walking down the street and crossed the street when he reached the train tracks. He walked back up the other sidewalk, staring at my house all the while, and kept going until he reached the main intersection and turned to the corner. I stood in the corner of the window, watching the street for what seemed like hours until my parents' car pulled up in front of my house along with the neighbor's car. They all got out, and my mother headed towards the house while my father started chatting with the neighbor's husband. They had left me with an emergency contact number for somebody that wasn't going to be home, because they were going out together. I unlocked the door and booked it downstairs, instantly crying with relief as I unlocked the inner door, and then the glass porch door. I recounted the events to my parents in the kitchen, through tears, and they had just started to calm me down. And that's when the doorbell rang. I started to shake and cry again, and my father burst out of his seat and barreled towards the door and swung it open. And there he was. The man. He stood there smiling a disgusting smile, and I immediately took off down into the basement. My mother was right behind me. I heard my father and him arguing loudly for a few minutes, and then my father slammed the door. My father called my mother and I back upstairs, and then after I made him promise that the man was gone, I walked up and into the kitchen. My father sat me down and explained the situation. Earlier, my father hadn't had enough cash on him for the pizzas. He had told the delivery guy that he would be back in four hours but had to make the game and didn't have time to get more cash. The delivery guy agreed 
wished my brother good luck in his game, and then had passed the message on to the guy who would be working the closing night shift, that delivery guy had misunderstood, thinking that he was to return immediately and collect payment. He explained it all to my father, as if he had rang the doorbell a few times and then left. Not that he had been circling the house, terrifying me for over an hour. He told my father that he wasn't sure if anyone was home, so he looked around the back, but only saw my dog, so he left, only returning coincidentally minutes after my parents returned, armed with a convincing story. Kids have such an imagination. Sorry that I frightened him. All lies, but my parents didn't believe me. Suffice it to say, I brought my books with me to every soccer game after that. This happened when I was in my early teens in the late 80s. My family lived in a very secluded, forested area. We had a long driveway, and our small home sat on a square acre of mowed grass with woods on two sides. I was alone late one night, talking with a buddy from school. I often rode my bike to town over the summer, and he invited me to come over and spend the night. It was a 20-mile trip over completely empty country roads, but it was always an adventure, and I seldom hesitated to go when I had a place to stay. I told him it was a sure thing. I would call my mother at work and then start my ride. Here's where it gets creepy. Once I hung up the phone and started getting dressed, I picked up the phone again to call my mom. The line was dead. This had never happened before. It was a sturdy rotary phone, and we had never had problems with it. My thoughts instantly went to the small phone box at the back of the house. It was a tiny round junction with nothing but a rubber covering. Behind the cover was the exposed connection between the phone pole and our inside line. The wires were twisted together and capped, but completely vulnerable. I questioned why I would even think about that. Why would I jump to conclusions about the cause of the dead line? I was overwhelmed with a feeling of dread that didn't make sense, and I was wrestling with my thoughts. I decided to behave as though I was in real danger, but calm myself by focusing on how unlikely it was and how my imagination was probably getting the best of me. But I could not shake the feeling that I was in trouble. I finished dressing and strapped a buck knife to my hip. The old Rambo knives with the compass in the stock. It was cheap, but very big. I moved quietly and planned how I would leave the house. I remember this very well. I would slide out the front door and pull it closed behind me, locked. I would not be able to get back in. I would grab my bike from against the wall on the enclosed porch, spin around, and use my elbow to press the button of the handle on the screen door, and then jump down the concrete steps. I would hop on my bike and speed down the driveway. It was very dark outside, but there were bright lights in the front and rear of the house that created big pools of light in the yard. That's all the light I would have. I executed my maneuver just as I planned, but my elbow slipped off the button on the handle and banged into the door as it opened, and within seconds, I was pumping down the gravel driveway. I turned my head to the left, filling my ears with the roar of air I was cutting through, and stopped pedaling. My eyes fixed on the rear of the house. I was 100% sure someone was coming. I don't know how or why. It was only a moment, but I didn't look away, despite my own skepticism. At the last instant, I saw him. A man wearing dark clothes and a mask came tearing out of the lit yard around the back of the house and plunged into the deep shadow along the side, heading for the front, where I had been only seconds ago. I was invisible, wearing black from head to toe, and instead of running straight for me, he went for the porch 
where the commotion I had just made had come from. I turned forward and leaned into the pedals. I could barely see the driveway, but I had ridden my bike down it many times at night, and I could make out the large stone gate posts before the dirt road. I almost wrecked turning the corner, but recovered and sped away. About a mile further, and I finally stopped at the intersection to a paved road. My heart was pounding in my chest, and my forehead was sweaty. I stood there for a bit and got my breathing under control while I tried to digest what had just happened. My thoughts were racing. I knew very well what I saw and that I was now out of danger. All I could do was press on. My neighbors were Amish, so they didn't have a phone. I wouldn't have known what to say to them anyway. When I got to my friend's house much later, I told him what happened and called my mom. She listened and didn't give me a hard time, but I could tell she didn't know what to think. She wouldn't be home until morning and said that she would be careful. And that was it. I had heard laughter once from the edge of the woods, and things in the yard had been moved on occasion, but no one else had these experiences, and I assumed it was kids just fooling around, except for that one night of course. I doubt the kids around my neighborhood would know how to disconnect a phone line, and why would they? This encounter happened to me while attending college at Auburn University in Alabama. It was the hectic part of the fall school semester when students are busy preparing for final exams. I was no exception to the rule. One of the nice things about Auburn University, which is not uncommon to many other colleges, is that the library remains open 24 hours a day during final exams. As you can imagine, such an open invitation draws in a large crowd. Students occupy all the available space on several floors with books and ideas. On this particular night, at least one of them was not a student. Let me explain. I arrived at the library early in the afternoon, navigated my way to the third floor, and quickly located a desk for intense concentration. Hours passed as I put my attention on the pages of my organic chemistry textbook. It became dark outside. I was extremely happy with my progress. I celebrated with a sandwich, chips, and a few beers. At just past 11 o'clock, nature called. I entered the bathroom and made my way to the stall furthest from the entrance. A few minutes passed, and then another person entered. Here is where things turned creepy. We are two, and we are alone. For what seemed like an eternity, I only heard silence. No toilet flushing, no feet shuffling, no hand washing, absolutely nothing. Then, he locked the door. At this point, my mind was racing. Was I about to be robbed? Random act of violence? A joke? I tried to stay calm as he walked over to the stall that I occupied. Eventually he broke the silence with an offer I will never forget. He offered me a happy meal. I kindly but firmly rejected and thankfully he exited the bathroom. I quickly finished my business, washed my hands and left in a hurry. The exchange had me absolutely spooked. Study time was over. On my way out of the library, I spotted him. Our eyes locked briefly, and then I turned away. I could feel his stare. All that I remember about him is that he was a middle-aged man wearing makeup and a McDonald's uniform. I haven't eaten McDonald's since.
I once met up with an old friend of mine, a friend I had known for years prior to the meetup in November 2017. I had actually met this person on a dating site. However, as time went on, the relationship between us became strictly platonic. There were no red flags. My gut did not warn me, so I completely trusted this person. We met up in town, behind a bus station, on a grassy hill, surrounded by trees and a tall wall. Our meeting was just to have a smoke and to catch up a bit. The meetup was fine. I had actually started smoking a few months before, so I was still relatively new to it. He had brought up something new for me to try. Purple Haze. I wasn't at all anxious about trying it, as I completely trusted this person and would never believe that he would lie to me. We spoke during this time about work, our previous relationships, and random stuff. About a half an hour later, I started to feel extremely lightheaded and anxious. I suddenly had this strange feeling where I did not feel comfortable at all, and I really wanted to go home. When I asked him if I could go home, he offered to take me home, but I said, no, it's okay. He offered again, please let me take you home, you'll be safe with me, I wouldn't hurt you. I shook my head and said, no thank you, I can take myself. When I started to walk away, I felt like I was walking on a cloud. My head became dizzy and my eyesight was a little blurry. I had never felt like this before and in time, I started to panic. When we made our way down the hill toward the bus station, I was relieved, as there was a lot of people around. So if anything happened, someone would step in. I became extremely terrified of him. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that told me to get away from him, and when I got to the bus station, I told him I would call a taxi there and go home. His tone was no longer nice, but very stern. I'm gonna take you home now, and he began to pull at my jacket. I told him, no, and that I was going home on my own. He pulled my jacket harder, and I fell against him. He pulled me into him and told me I didn't need to be scared, but I was so, so terrified. At this point, I started to feel very paranoid, and I couldn't see properly. I pushed him away from me and rubbed my eyes, and called for a taxi. He tried to pull my phone from me and yelled in my face, Do you listen? I'm taking you home. I noticed a few people had stopped and asked if I was okay. All I remember was that I wanted to go home, so a lady kindly called a taxi for me and waited with me, made sure I was okay and helped me into the taxi. During the time that I waited for the taxi, he kept trying to get me to come to his car with him, but the lady that was looking after me told him to go home and that she was going to take me home instead. So, he left. When I got home, I gave the taxi driver money and told him to keep the change. I didn't want to wait around, and I just wanted to get into my bed because at that time, it was the only place that I would feel safe from harm. That evening, I laid in my bed for five hours straight, staring at the ceiling. I don't remember if I thought about anything, or if my mom came in at any time. I just remember lying in bed, doing nothing, until the paranoia and the sickly feeling began to wear off. I remember looking at my phone, and seeing I had 32 missed calls from him, 10 voicemails that were left, and over 50 text messages. The messages were weird. He had sent around 20 messages just asking where I was and when I got home. And in one of the voicemails, he had told me how he had this fantasy of taking me home whilst drugged up and tying me up. He wanted to blindfold me, and he wanted me to submit myself to him. I freaked out and blocked him on all social media, and I blocked his number. Before the blocking, 
I told him if he ever contacted me again, then I would call the police. I heard nothing from him for a month, until I received a text from an unknown number asking me how I was. I hadn't even given my number to anyone, so I ignored it. I then received another message a few minutes later saying they missed me and that they would see me soon. I asked who they were. No reply. Nothing. I have spoken with some friends in regards to my story, and all of them have explained that what I smoked was probably spice. Spice looks a lot like weed, but the effects are a lot stronger and more dangerous. If that lady had not shown up to look after me, or if I had passed out completely, I don't want to know what could have happened. A little backstory. When I was 19, I lived with my mom in a ranch-style house on a road that backed up to a large field. On the other side was a main highway. About half a mile down from me was a loony farmer, and about a mile on the other side of me was pretty much a crack house. I guess someone used to live there, but it was run down. I will say that the crackheads were pretty quiet. Other than those two houses, we were isolated. At the time, I was working full-time and going to school full-time. One of my classes ended at 10.30 p.m. I often wouldn't get home that day of the week until about 11.15. I was driving home one night, and I noticed some guy walking down the road. He had a yellow shirt and track pants. I remember his outfit because it was stupid. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my road because of the whole crack house thing but I instinctively looked over at him when I drove past. He turned and smiled and waved, which really freaked me out, so I speed the half-mile home and pull into the driveway, weirded out. I made sure all the doors and windows were secure, and then sat on the couch to be a paranoid freak and wait to make sure the dude walked past my house. Except, he didn't and there was another guy with them, dressed in darker clothes. They actually walked up my driveway and started playing around with my car, testing the handles and stuff. In my hurry, I forgot to grab my phone from my car, so I was kind of worried that's what they were after, until the guy in yellow started approaching my door. I'm freaking out, so I go and wake my mom up. She's bleary, and I'm trying to explain the situation when we both hear the doorknob turn very slowly. Good thing it was deadbolted. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and then the guy in the yellow shirt knocked. I perched up on the couch so I could get a good look at him and his friend still in the driveway. My porch light was on because of the sensor. Yeah? My mom said. Uh, you dropped your wallet. I told my mom that I had my wallet. It was in my purse. So she calmly told him that she had her wallet and it was too late to be knocking on people's doors. I remember perfectly what he said next, even though this was about six years ago. Okay, I'm not a bad guy, just so you know. We all stood there. No one moved. Not even the guy at the door. Not even when the porch light went off. Then he tried the handle again. My mom told me to call the cops so she could get the gun, and I told her I didn't have my phone. So she walked to the kitchen to grab hers from the charger. She handed me the phone and walked to the bathroom, stared out the window into the backyard. Then she went to her room to grab her Ruger. I was talking to the cops and explaining the situation, all while watching the two guys, explaining that there were two suspicious guys at our door, when my mom came back out and said, one in the backyard too. 
which explained why she looked out the bathroom window. She glimpsed him from the kitchen and went to get a more discreet look. My mom walked back over to the door with her gun and loudly said, If you try to come in my house again, I'm going to open the door and shoot you. I have no idea why she said that instead of waiting for the cops to arrive, but the guys took off down the road. I told her and she rushed to the bathroom where the guy apparently in the backyard saw his friends running down the road and sprinted off after them. They were going in the direction of the crack house. The cops searched our house and our front yard and then went to the drug house where they found five guys hanging around. One was the guy with the yellow shirt and I'm assuming his friends were with him. They did get arrested and nothing weird like that ever happened again. But I was on edge for a while. I still make sure the doors are locked at all times every day, even though now I live in a much nicer area. When I was a teenager, I was goth. Black hair, black clothes, black makeup, even had a pair of combat boots. My friend and I, in typical goth fashion, hung out at the local cemetery. We started going as a joke, but soon discovered that we liked the peace we found there. That all changed one night. My friend called to see if I wanted to hang out, and I did. None of our other friends were available. They were either working or recovering from partying the night before, so we were on our own. My friend picked me up and we drove up to the cemetery. We were hanging out, smoking cigarettes, and BSing about the latest issues she was having with her boyfriend when we noticed at the top of the hill that we were on, about 100 feet away, a bonfire had been lit. You have to understand that this cemetery is about a block off campus of a major university and it's not uncommon for college students to go there to party. My friend and I sighed knowing that we would have to get going soon. It was illegal to be in the cemetery after dark, and we knew the police would show up, because some jerks decided that they needed a bonfire. We decided to finish our cigarettes and then take off. Just then, the most horrible stench came wafting down the hill from the direction of the bonfire. My friend gagged and covered her mouth. I groaned and said, What the heck? My friend shook her head, saying, I don't know what they're doing. Let's just leave. We get in the car, and one of us suggested, I honestly don't remember who, maybe we should just go and see what they're doing. My stomach turned, and a cold shiver went through my body. My friend must have had the same feeling, because, at the same time, we both said, No, let's just leave. My friend turned the car on, switched on her headlights, put the car in reverse, and looked over her shoulder before starting to back up. I was still looking up the hill. A figure stepped in front of the bonfire. I could only see a silhouette, but I was sure whoever it was, was watching us. A feeling of terror hit me, and I said, Go, go, go! Getting louder and more panicked with each word. My friend looked back up the hill for a second, and just as the figure took a step towards us, she slammed on the gas and peeled out, going in reverse down the hill. She rammed the gear shift into drive, and we were out. We didn't say anything for a while until she said, What were they burning? I shook my head. I don't know. She dropped me off at home and I went to bed. The next morning, I woke up and went out to the kitchen. My mom was there drinking her morning coffee, and I joined her. We talked about her job for a bit when she suddenly comes out with, Did you hear what happened last night? I shrug and say no. She then tells me that a woman she worked with was kidnapped from the parking garage. Oh my gosh, I said. Did they find her? Yes, but it was too late, she replied. They found her this morning up in the cemetery. 
I froze. My brain was going a mile a minute, the realization slowly creeping in. Needless to say, I never hung out at the cemetery at night again. I think back to our decision to leave instead of investigating the fire. That one decision could have changed everything. A few years ago I lived in my car. I was fresh out of college and overwhelmed with student debt, and being young, dumb, and 21, I thought car living was a good way to save money. I live in Southern California, so the rent is high and the weather is temperate enough to make this possible year-round. One night, I decided to park in a neighborhood I thought I knew well. It was right by the beach and a couple blocks next to an ex-boyfriend of mine, so I felt safe there as I had walked the streets at night plenty of times. I parked, locked the doors, hung up the curtains so no one could look in, plugged in my earplugs so the cars passing wouldn't wake me, and fell asleep. Now my earplugs were effective, but crappy, and I could always count on them falling off in the middle of the night. I actually preferred this, because it meant I could fall asleep, but still hear my phone alarm in the morning. It was about 2 a.m. when I woke up to my earplugs already have fallen off and something feeling wrong. Odd scratching noises were coming from the window. It started at the passenger side door and then moved to the back seat doors. I froze, unsure of what to make of it, painfully aware that I leave my windows slightly cracked at night for ventilation. I honestly didn't know what to do, so I stayed frozen, trying to make sense of it all. That's when the flashlight turned on, and some man unmistakably was shining his light in, trying to find a crack in the curtains, and to my horror, he found one and shined it right where my face was, it's hard to explain, but the position of my head made it so I could piece together what was happening, based on the light everywhere, but he couldn't see my eyes. The scratching then continued, and I knew I was screwed. This went from potential attempted car theft to someone knowing I was in the car. I was literally paralyzed with fear, and couldn't will myself to grab the baseball bat that I had. However, my last year of college I took a class called RAD, which stood for Rape Aggression Defense, and remembered the number one rule, yell confidently and confrontationally at the man. I wish I could say I screamed something truly bad, but what left my lips was a loud, aggravated and forceful, EXCUSE ME. It was super lame but it echoed. To my immense relief, I hear the sounds of his footsteps running away at top speed. But I kid you not, the man was laughing as he ran like it was some kind of game. I was still paralyzed, but eventually, him running gave me the courage to get up, grab my bat, and shove my way to the front seat, where I started the car and sped away. I didn't see him, and I spent the night at a friend's house. I live in an apartment now. It wasn't until the next morning I realized I had parked one block away from a bar and, at the time of the incident, the bar had just closed. I go to school in a big city that is one of the least safe cities in the US. I chose this school for nursing and definitely not for the location. I live in a row house, which is what we call it, off campus with four other girls, cheaper and nicer than dorms, or so we thought. I guess you get what you pay for. We are all girls and sophomores in college. As you would guess, we go out and drink 
and then come back to do things that we don't remember. We had just started our rent in August. Three floors, plus a basement, which was padlocked by the owners. Understandable. We would definitely have parties down there, to avoid immediate cleanup. The house was great. Amazing location to the school and work. I am a CNA, who works odd hours. It was not expensive. I never lived with that many people before. Just one roommate. So before, we definitely knew if one of us had misplaced or changed something. I started to notice my snacks were either half gone or completely gone. I was getting annoyed. But a house of so many people, it's too much work to go figure out who ate what. So I ignored it. We all just let it go because who wants a whole house fight? I work until about 11 in the NICU, get home at about 11.30, mostly on weeknights. I started to notice pans left out, or snack wrappers around. I thought it was odd, because none of my roommates had done that before, but just thought, oh, they probably drank a bottle of wine, and then went to bed, and forgot about it. Again, my roommates started making comments. This time... We started to ask because it was getting annoying, all our food being gone, and things being left. I knew it was one of them, but who wants to admit they ate someone else's snacks in college? Snacks are a high commodity. We chalked it up to the girl who always smokes and eats her weight in food. She swore it wasn't her. This went on for two months. It got more obvious. Someone was clearly taking everyone's food. Definitely the girl that always smokes. I have seen her eat a whole pantry of snacks in one night. I wish that it was her. One night at work, I was about to get off, but a situation happened, and I didn't end up leaving until 12.30. I got home and was about to collapse. I wanted to go to bed ASAP. I walked in through the front door, and the stairs are directly in front of you. You can also see down the side into the kitchen. I walked in and saw someone in the kitchen, but was way too tired to say hi, so I just went straight upstairs. When I got to the second floor, I noticed all my roommates' doors were closed, which always means they are either in their room for the night or asleep. I got a weird feeling. They were all asleep, right? I texted our house group chat, asking if anyone was in the kitchen. I felt stupid for even asking. Two responded no, and they said the other two had been asleep. I knew that it was not one of my roommates in the kitchen at that moment. I dialed 911, but didn't press call. I crept into my roommate's room across the hall. Thankfully, or maybe not thankfully, she didn't have her door locked. I whispered, telling her I think someone is in the house. She gave me the widest eyes ever and almost looked like she was going to cry. She mouthed to make the call. The whole time we were dead silent. We didn't hear really anything at all. I was starting to think I was seeing things after such a long day at work and was regretting that I dialed thinking that I'm going to look like an idiot when they show up and I was just overtired and dreaming. We explain what's going on and they said they will send someone ASAP. And that actually does mean right away since it is a big and dangerous city. The police showed up and I didn't even want to go downstairs but the operator confirmed it was them. So I did. But the whole time I could swear the operator could hear my heart beating. The police came in and looked around. I'm thinking I look so dumb. They ask if there are any other floors. We tell them technically the basement, but it's padlocked, so really no. They check the basement just in case, and yeah, they were right. A man had been living in the basement. The lock was pulled off the hinges and just kind of propped against the wall. We never looked at that, though. 
we rarely went out back. The guy had taken a comforter of one of my roommates out of the hall closet, had a mattress from God knows where, and his clothes. Well, he was the one moving and eating all of our food. He would come out in the middle of the night while we were sleeping. He started getting more comfortable. I don't know if he was drugged out and forgot to clean his tracks or if he didn't really care. My roommates and I have pretty consistent schedules during the week, probably letting him think that any time after 12 was good to come out. We never slept with our individual doors locked, and that's what freaks me out the most. He had access to any one of us at any moment, and we had no idea. When he was getting arrested, I was the only one to go down and look. I don't know why I did. I really wish that I didn't. He was the scariest looking man I had ever seen. When I was 19, in the early 90s, my brother and his wife were newly married and living in Baltimore. I was from Maryland but had not yet spent time in that city. I knew it wasn't totally safe in parts, but I also knew that I was just going straight to my brother and sister-in-law's house, so it would be fine, until I turned onto the wrong street. This was Martin Luther King Boulevard, and back then, it was a stretch of abandoned gas stations, sketchy bars, boarded up houses. A few people were walking in the middle of the street, drinking out of paper bags, I knew that I had messed up, and instead of freaking out and getting more lost, I pulled into an abandoned gas station. There was a bank of payphones, and I parked about 10 feet from them, hopped out, and then called my brother. He was impatient at first, because he knew the city quite well, but it was my first time driving in it, and I was trying to write down his directions as he gave them to me. Just then, something caught my eye and I looked over at my car. Three men were leaning against it, two on the passenger side and one against the driver's side front door. They were all staring at me with their arms crossed. I started to silently cry, thankful that I had on sunglasses. My brother heard me sniffling and said, Why are you upset? I'm giving you directions. But I couldn't tell him what was going on as the men were within earshot. I got the rest of the directions, put them in my pocket, and walked to my car. The man that was leaning against my door reached up and wiped the tears from my cheek. Then he said, Why are you crying, baby? Nothing bad has happened yet. Without even thinking about it, I responded, fully sobbing now. I just shot my boyfriend, and I'm in a lot of trouble. The cops are... That's all I got out. The three men had all taken off in separate directions at full sprints away from me. If I hadn't been gifted with that lie from my guardian angels or whomever saved me that night, who knows what would have happened. Good thing it was dead bolted. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and walked to the, walked to the, walked to the, walked to the, walked to the door, and then yellow, sh and then yellow shirt, and then the guy in the yellow shirt knocked. He had a yellow shirt and track pants. I remember his outfit because it was stupid. It wasn't weird. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my room. <laughs> 